Let's kick it. <laughs> Hello and welcome to part 2 of what's doing 2250. Now if you just stumbled upon this video first and I'm not being all avant-garde about it, there is a part 1 and there should be an annotation on screen somewhere so you can click that and watch the first part if you want to. Otherwise, let's get on to it. 2250 also upgraded Internet Explorer with Microsoft's vision of how you would create content for the rich web as it would stand in 2000. Now, these come in the shape and form of the HTML time extensions. Now, I don't know too much about these, but I do know that it's pretty much just XML embedded in a web page and quite a lot of XML for quite little content. If I open up the things, these are from the Windows 7 SDK. I don't know why they're still there since Microsoft dropped most of the support for HTML and time in I ie 7 not all of it but most of it as you can see you get some sort of let's run that let's run those again these are all not using flash or gifs or anything this is just xml on a web page and let's have a look and see how much they're not they're all right they're not brilliant or anything are they they're not they're not really that long as well to just loop so if we look at the first one Okay, let's look at the second one. There we go. And if we look at the source code for this, we can see how much it actually takes to run that little bit of animation. And here we are. That's not that. It's this bit here. Where it says animation. And it's XML, like I said. And it's... Well, anyway, it's all this XML which defines the elements, how they move, where they go to, if they're see-through and all that good stuff and for how long the animation takes to play and you can see it's all of this and it stops here where it gets to the slash t par and it started all the way up here so you can see it's pretty much two full pages of XML just to get that little bit of about two seconds of animation two three seconds of animation yeah, so this was Microsoft's answer to well, Flash, pretty much, and it didn't require any extra tools, obviously, you could just write it in XML, but with two, two pages of XML for about two seconds of work, it really didn't take off, as you could expect, because people were like, I don't want to write all that, I'll just use Flash, or GIFs, or, because you can use sound with this, there's no examples of that, and I'm not writing one, but you can use sound with it, but... Like I said, people were like, you know, I'll just embed, embed Windows Media Player on my, play, on my page and stick a WAV on there and that'll work. But yeah, people just nicking other people's animated GIFs and sticking them on the web page. I was at web pages around 2000, weren't they? I know I was anyway. So yeah, HTML and Time, it started off in this build and it never really caught on, I don't think. One of the most interesting things about this build, and one of the most frustrating ones as well, is a new technology which was included with this beta version of DirectX 8. Di I've done it again, DirectX 8, which was included in this build. And it's in the game controllers, gaming options, control panel option. And it's this one here, the disk usage and the installation tabs. Now here, it talks about it down here, yep. The settings you specify apply only to games that support application manager technology. Now I thought this was quite a nifty feature because it you can I think it's this one. Yep. When disk space is needed to install new games, Windows may need to partially uninstall the least played games to make room for the new games. So I thought that sounds like a pretty decent feature, quite a cool feature. Now I don't play many games. But I tried to use this technology to see if I could get like an example working. But the thing is, it seems to have gone about being like completely removed like two months after this build. That was it. The entire lifespan of the technology was about two months. So that's why it's the most inter one of the most interesting things for me because you don't really see many technologies included with Windows and then booted out two months later. 
Now the only mention I could find of this technology on the internet, I mean application manager is a sort of a generic term, but the only one I could find in conjunction with DirectX 8 is from the Beta 1 SDK. And that, I can show you that here. And here it is, I found this document on a Polish website, so thanks to them for archiving it. But it was only this document, not the entire SDK beta, so I couldn't actually use it, the technology. But if you search for AppMan, you get this entire section on the DirectX Application Manager. And down here, unfortunately, the, it mentions the components are only in, this, in the SDK, they're not actually in Windows. They're not shipped with DirectX 8, they're in the SDK and you ship them with your app and then you use them like that. So unfortunately these DLs aren't included with Windows so I can't show you that. Now I found the actual final version of the DirectX 8 SDK and like I said there's no mention of this feature there at all. So I don't know what happened to it but it didn't last long because it, like I said it's gone by 2267 I think the build is these tabs no longer exist in 2267 and these control it so I don't know what happened to it but it seems like a quite a decent technology and I really wanted to have a little mess around with it but I couldn't find the SDK and I couldn't find anything and how to use it so unfortunately these tabs are all I got to show for it also introduced in this build but thankfully still around today uh, mouse trails if you go to mouse properties and point options and you click display, display pointer trails you get all these nice pointer trails and that's new for this build and you can have a maximum of 16 which is the long option and it goes all the way down to short which I think is 1 and yeah so actually it's quite a nifty new thing this is there's actually UI for the feature there's usually no UI for these fe mouse features as we saw with click lock and I think the other one which I can't remember but yeah there was no UI for those and we had to enable them in the registry or with system parameters info API function but yeah there's actually there's actual thing another thing about this is it's actually mostly like the XP one now isn't it I mean, we've got the click lock one here. They've got rid of the jack in the box, and now it's just a, a folder opening and closing. Quite sad to see the jack in the box go, but there we are. But yeah, it's mostly like you, the XP version now. We've got all the options. I don't think we'll be seeing any more additions or any new mouse options for quite a while yet. The integration of internet services continues apace in this build. Because if we go to my doc, oh, if we go to my documents, and then my music, on the left in the tasks pane, we get a shop for music online link, and if we click that, it won't work because the site behind it has long since died. But if we wait a minute, we can see it was trying to connect to eShop.com. So this site's not around nowadays, but thanks to the Internet Archive, we can see pretty much how it would have looked like. This is from the month before the build, so it's from June and the build's from July and it's just pretty much a normal MSN eShop and the hot new music of the time was Bon Jovi's Crush and we can see in the menu there's a shocking lack of rap and hip hop in there which I do not like one bit but there we go, that's a shocking lack and as we see, Voice of an Angel, Charlotte Church, jeez whatever happened to her anyway, yeah that was the, the site it goes to, it's one of the MSN shopping sites and yeah, that's what it would try to connect to, uh, to get you to spend your hard-earned wonga on music. Now you might be thinking, why have I called this video NT Me when so far we haven't seen anything to do with me? Well, that's about to change now, because in this build is the first rough cut of an oob. Oh, I call them oob, some people call them oobies. You know, the out-of-box experience, that's what I'm on about. And it's Windows System 32, and it's pretty much a straight copy and paste of the Me one with the Whistler branding thrown in. MS Oob. Now, what you can do is run Oob with the slash F flag, and that means you could just run it whenever. You don't have to just you don't have to get um, sysprep and all that gone on to reset it. You just 
run it with the slash f flag and wait a bit. Welcome. And you get the oob. And as you heard there, you get the you get it. How can I help you? Rubbish speech as well. I know. Now obviously mail in has a bunch of options and if you click on it then you get more rubbish speech. If you are ready to begin, click the next button. Now I never had me, but I read a review of this oob from Paul Thurrett's site and he's he mentioned this awful, awful synthesized speech that Merlin gives you. And I had no idea it was that bad until I ran this and then well I mean that's just pretty rubbish, isn't it? You have decided not to accept this license agreement. You will not be able to use Microsoft Windows. Like I said, none of the, if you just clicked next out and exited, it wouldn't affect anything. And also, you get this. Oh, I thought you were going to say something then. You also get this screen here. This doesn't work. You can type in whatever you want. I did notice though that not all the keys are used, like 0 and 1, Z and A and a couple of others aren't in the list. don't know why that is. I don't actually really care. Like what, you can just do that and it works. And you see they didn't change it everywhere. It says here we recommend you register online with Microsoft by registering your copy of Windows Me. Microsoft can notify you of through product updates and all that. So yeah, they didn't quite change everything, but they got most of it right. Oops, again. You have decided to use an existing internet account. Now just click the next button to go on. One of the fun things I like about is helping this, if you click on the Who to Call for Assistance button. He looks it up. Contact and, your computer manufacturer. Very helpful there, Merlin, very helpful. Yeah, I see there's no thing to use a, a like a broadband internet here, it's all you have to use a, a modem and dial up. And if this happens, you sort of get stuck if, because you can't click next, and so you can't set up here. And also, skip doesn't work. So if you try to ring the account, it doesn't actually work, and it hangs the oob. And you can't even click on mailing file because he's not interested. Oh, there you go. Oh, it does eventually work. Oh, I thought it got stuck and everything, but no, nope, apparently it does work. In the end, oh, and that does exit it. Click and skip, exit is it, so not very well done there. You don't get the exit screen where he gives you a trophy for actually doing it. But yeah, there's the me style loop sort of slightly changed for Whistler in this build. There's also a few other screens that I noticed in the loop, but I think they're actually part of it, or if they can, I couldn't get them to trigger. But there is some, well, funny options, shall we say. Uh, but they're in HTML. Yep, additional user information for, and I presume that'll get replaced by whoever is the the brand of the PC. And you can select hardcore noise as music you like, and you can also select hacking PCs as a interesting hobby that you have. So yeah, nice to sort of have next buttons on them because he's meant to go in the middle of it rather than the whole page. Another thing this build brings to NT that has been shamelessly stolen from ME is the home networking wizard. Now I don't think there's any UI to actually trigger it so you have to use run dll32 and it's in hnetwiz.dll and it's called the home net wizard run dll. Microsoft must be a fan of redundancy there. And what you get is this. It's not quite the same as the ME version, and I can show you that here. As you can see, the ME version has a hyperlink to the help, which doesn't exist on the Whistler version. 
and some of the pages are a bit different and we'll set the ME version to run on the Whistler version so that we can see if it works properly so we'll select yes there and then we'll go back to this one so as you can see the second page here is a bit different now this might throw you as it did me the first time since it puts in the computer name as test only here I thought that this might just be the dial like a UI run through and it didn't actually do anything but it does do things so it just doesn't read the computer name properly and that doesn't really make a difference until you get to this screen because if you change the computer name here then the computer name that shows up in here that will actually change it'll still say 2250 vert even if I put something say like Bob's PC in here then it will change the computer name to Bob's PC but in that dialog in the properties it will say 2250 vert still so don't change that if you don't have to so if we just leave it at 2250 vert so otherwise it'll bugger up all the SMB and shared network folders yeah, you can also share the documents over the over the network which I don't want to do and then you get to the end of it now see this list view here doesn't work which would detail the changes, that doesn't work, nothing gets put in there but like I said it does actually make changes to your computer so if I click finish then I don't think it, don't know if it actually makes changes to the network in part of the computer but it does change the computer name and the workgroup name if you change them in there so let's run through this one let's not share that, you see it's different as well I uh, don't need a setup disk We're done. And if I open it in the Explorer, then it didn't go through the other computer. It didn't go through Whistler, as I could tell from the the two computers network icon on the bottom of virtual box down here, because the Whistler one wasn't working, wasn't moving. So yeah, the two NICs on this computer actually just connected it directly to the internet, so that didn't change anything. And likewise, the Whistler version didn't change anything about its network connection but it would change the computer name and the web group if you put them in in that so yeah the wizard is mostly UI only except it will fudge up your computer name if you change it the last major new feature of this build is a collaboration between the kernel and of all things the defragger so if we run the defragger and just defrag let me click on it it should be pretty much alright. I don't know what it's doing that. This feature is, I think it's an extension of Neptune's boot optimiz optimization, the fast boot, that, that's in the fast bike DLL, which was just for FAT file systems. But in this case, this applies to both FAT and NTFS, and it's the prefetcher. The prefetching feature of Windows is new in this build, and what it is, is opposed to the Neptune feature which created a sort of archive of the initial boot files and then used them to kickstart the boot. This defrag version which works in conjunction with the kernel and guided by a configurable file if you have one or not, if you don't it just does, I think it just does some default files but anyway, it moves files around the disk so that they're contiguous and obviously contiguous files load faster than files which are all around the disk and what this does is put files which are used like in the boot sequence right at the edges of the disk and right next to each other so it minimizes the hard drive seeking times and it should in theory lead to a faster boot and then since it prefetches it stays in the memory of windows and then they're used without having to hit the disk again now i had registry monitor open before i ran that to show you where in the registry it used and it looked at a key called defrag slash boot optimize function and it's enabled in this case so it went away and it tried to do it and as you can see from the optimize everything it didn't quite work because no space before the current location whatever that means but anyway it didn't work so yeah you can dictate how the files are laid out on disk if you set this key here path file name well this value and in this case I've set it to a file called cbits boot file 
And if we open that up, and if you've been spelunking around the Windows directories of more recent versions, you may recognize the layout of it. Nope. Well, if you don't, it's in the prefetch folder of mod modern Windows, and it's the layout.ini file. And obviously it just lists the files in order they should be on the disk for fastest boot. I presume that's what it's for. Anyway, yeah, in the more modern versions of Windows it's hard-coded so that, file, that register key is not there, or if it is it's not looked at, because it's just in this prefetch folder and it's the layout.ini file. But in this build of Windows Whistler, it is. It can be set. And likewise in XP as well. If I show you that. No, nope, not this. That. Not that. This. There we go. We can see that there's no layout.ini file anywhere. So in this build, I think it just runs off of some embedded knowledge in the kernel or somewhere else. Or just does the files from. I don't know, cluster 1 to cluster whatever. But anyway, yeah, that's new for this build and for many versions of Windows in the future. If you've ever run this build, you may have found out that pretty much no software designed for XP or above actually works, or no software that has a GUI anyway. And if you try and run it, even if it's like got a 2000 support, if you try and run it, you get something like this. Windows was not able to process the application binding information. Please refer to your system event log for further information. Now you'll get that because this is the first build which looks in the executable files for a manifest to set up. Well, a manifest for whatever reason, but primarily they're used to set up the updated common controls which give you the fancy dance, fancy pants graphics rather than the boring old windows controls which we've seen plenty of times and yeah it doesn't work in this build because the format used at this point of windows development is different to the format used in the final version and we can see the night and day difference here all these is internals tools have the same problem and it looks for a resource called RT manifest that's manifested in here as number 24 and it can be any number it needs to be but this I'll just copy it out because it's easier to see in word notepad than it is in right then so this is a good one this one would run and its assembly information is the first tag it's just an XML file basically and it tells you that it's dependent on comctl32 which is the common controls and version 6 which is the updated version there we go in the final version of XP you get a much more verbose version and you have to set up it's an actual valid XML file in the last in the most updated XP version Whereas in this version 2250, it's not, it's just a random fragments of XML which aren't actual valid XML. So yeah, and it chokes because it's expecting to see assembly as the first tag where as here you can see assembly is the first tag, whereas in the final XP versions it's just a normal XML tag is the first tag. So that's why it chokes, but if you edit it to just a cut down version of that, it usually works. So yeah, in this build, they've removed, they've moved the common controls, the updated ones. They're not in UX control anymore. They're now in the SXS folder in the Windows directory, the side-by-side -side folder. That's what SS SXS stands for. And there's only common control, the common controls in there, version six. So yeah, you need the manifest now to run these rather than just referencing UX control. And as you can see. At this point, US controls is not a different, it's just a copied version of common controls with a manifest outside of it. The last build was the first one to actually look for a manifest, but it looked for an external file. But since no nothing in the OS actually used that information, if it was present, I just didn't choose to show it. Whereas in this build, 
as you can see it does work and it's updated and the original boring controls and the proper nice new jersey ones obviously the colors aren't quite as they would be in final xp due to the professional fee but they are indeed updated one of the funniest things in this build is also because of a new feature and that is ironically it's to do with the exception reporting and if you enable this exception report what is meant to happen is that when a process crashes a new executable that's not a Dr. Watson will attach to the process and that will send make a error report and it will send it to Microsoft at, at some later point what actually happens though is and I'll just set this up so you can see the action unfolding when we have a crashing process so what I'm going to do is going to run explorer and make it crash like I did before with the debugging and here we go now explorer started crashing and things are starting to get a bit mental what's happening is Dr. Watson attached to the original explorer that crashed now this FHL this new program tries to attach to Dr. Watson but that cr but the FHL crashes so Dr. Watson, Watson attaches to it and obviously FHL tries to attach to it which crashes so Dr. Watson attaches to it and so on and so on and what we end up is what we end up with is quite a lot of processes which are doing nothing but crashing or in the case of the Dr. Watson's just hanging around for nothing and this keeps going and going as you can see we're up to 90 processes now, 93, 94 it's going the memory usage is climbing as well the commit charge, the CPU usage as well That's if you click them it gets rid of some of the Dr. Watson's but not enough to stop this loop, you can't click them fast enough to stop it from from the loop, the crash loop from this one and here we go, you finally get one that fails to run and that stops it when you have 129 processes and 99% of all available memory used and end up with 106 Dr. Watson windows and you can enjoy the fun and well I think this might be a test actually of the Explorer's taskbar grouping that's a joke I don't think it's actually a for Explorer's taskbar grouping but it highlights it quite adequately and then all the Dr. Watsons die apart from one which has the original FHL, one which survived anyway so yeah the FHL is actually part of the PC Health kit that's in these in the Whistler from now on and it's the fault handler ironically and that keeps crashing so yeah not quite the auspicious start for the fault handler there and I think that'll about do it for this build so if you're still watching, thank you for watching what's new in 2250, and I will see you in 2257. The build, not the year.